What's up, everybody? You're listening to the Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast with your boys, Matt Wolf and Joe Fear. Check it. What's up? Yo. We're back again. To the Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast. You said that perfect. Yes, I didn't I didn't say flow chart this week. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> it's a good week after all. I think it's a good sign that we have a good guest today as well. Oh, this guest is I have to say this is a this return is, guest. Uh, this is VIPs. probably up there in my top, you know, definitely top 5 podcasts we've ever recorded. You're not just saying that, are you? I'm definitely not. If you if we had a camera in the corner of the room while we were recording this, you would see us doing that little like mind blown symbol <laughs> multiple times throughout this episode. We actually went on a walk right after hanging up, uh, right after this call, and we we're just like smile on our face, like, oh my god, I gotta, <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> I gotta listen to this episode about ten more times, like put a lot of this stuff to just memory. Yeah. Like, where it's a total checklist that I can do a lot of my businessy stuff uh, adhering to what this uh, what was laid out on the episode. It was amazing. Yeah. So, we're talking to Roland Frazier today. He is one of the co founders of uh, Digital Marketer, uh, Traffic and Conversion Summit, The mm-hmm. War Room, among many other mm-hmm. uh, big name, well known digital marketing brands. And on this episode, we cover a wide range of topics. Um, and I don't even know how to like get into some of the topics. Well, I mean, we st- <laughs> well, we got some breaking news about Traffic and Conversion Summit and uh, some new locations. There's some breaking news, and uh, and Roland told us straight up this is the very first place you will hear this breaking news. So I'm gonna let that set for a sec- uh, sit for a second, and let Roland tell you what that news is. But hold tight, yep. he'll say it like, right in the beginning of the episode, so <laughs> you'll you'll <laughs> close that loop shortly. And uh, and then we went into really how. Uh, He's doing some cool stuff now when he looks at investments. He's looking for multiple exit strategies yeah. for that single like entity. And you know, that's splitting out all it he goes into it, but it's like this thing that he just fell into. Mm-hmm. And now that's one of his key ways to look for opportunities, filter, and then maybe acquire new things. Yeah. It's really, I th- I'd say the main focus of this conversation is how to scale your business through acquiring other businesses. And I know a lot of people listening to this probably think, wow, that sounds scary. I'm not somebody mm-hmm. who could go and acquire businesses. You got to hear this out because not only do we talk about all the reasons you would probably want to acquire a business. I think he lists off seven or eight reasons. Mm-hmm. Here are the reasons you should acquire businesses. He also explains... Here's how you go and do it with no money out of pocket. Here's how you do it with no money down and go and acquire businesses to scale your own business without using either your own money or sometimes any money at all. And the coolest thing in that last thing you just said there with the no money down, I've asked and I've thought about this for so long now. I'm like, I want to like a mini playbook or go to guide that has like, here are the, here are the deal types, you know, if going into and I want to, I want to leverage this or partner up with someone I want to just have like a list of things I can jog my memory and be like, okay, oh, I could probably try that in this scenario. Yeah. And I've never found anybody, anything like that. And the folks I've asked are like, ah, there's just a million ways to do it, which is true. But I still want to like, all right, well, so what are the, some of the biggies? Mm-hmm. Uh, Roland literally lists those out yeah. and goes into detail when and why and how those work. And I'm just like, oh. Yeah, this no. This is, is this is a master class on scaling your business through acquisitions, and then we also touched on. Uh, Roland's got a, a new podcast called um, uh, Business Lunch with Roland Fraser. That's right. <laughs> uh, he just launched that, so we also discussed why he decided to get into a podcast and what it's done for him so far, and where he sees the podcast going. And that was a really fascinating discussion because podcasting is something close to our own hearts. And he's, uh, he's about to have some. Uh, he's about to have some. You know. Just random guys like Richard Branson on his show and, yeah. you know, Matt Wolf and Joe Fear yeah. and, you know, Sarah Blakely. So it's, yeah, it's a cool show. So you should probably go check it out. Yeah. So Business Lunch with Roland Frazier. Check it out. It's one of the Digital Marketer podcasts. Yep. And, uh, but the, a cool thing when we asked him about this is like, hey, so what are, what are some things you're learning? He basically, he's been, he's been mining his guests for like how they can think bigger goal set and all that stuff. And he digs into what this commonality thing is. Yeah. So he's definitely found some common traits among the most successful entrepreneurs he's interviewed. And so he kind of broke down in this episode as well. These are some of the common traits from all these guests that I've interviewed over the, over this time. Yeah, this, this, this is a good one. And we'll probably have a round three with Roland because 
you can never have enough. Absolutely. <laughs> it's so good. Uh, uh, before we dive in real quick, yes. uh, we do have our traffic course. We're still running this yes, promo for it where you can actually get a free Hustle & Flow Chart t-shirt. And I'm actually wearing one of those t-shirts right now. I'm looking down at it and playing with it and it's rubbing my belly. pretty nice. It's I a pretty mean, nice belly, t-shirt. Yes. It says Hustle & Flow Chart, not Hustle & Flow Shart. No. <laughs> those are the defect the poop emoji shirts. Yeah. You don't want those ones. But you can get one of those by going to evergreenprofits.com slash traffic buying our traffic course and uh, we'll give you one for free if you type in shirt in the coupon code the yes. coupon code yes. or you can go to our store on our website and buy one for 10 bucks but you get one for free if you get our traffic course there you go so learn all about it evergreenprofits.com slash traffic it's how we run traffic perpetually every single day on all different platforms once you learn this you can basically sell anything you want or do it for other people that's fine too or sell affiliate product you can do anything you we sell affiliate products. That's and our own do. products. We like it and grow a podcast. Why are we whispering? Because it's cool and okay. it's a secret. It's top secret. <laughs> Shh. Okay, let's go talk to Roland because Roland's way more interesting than, where our, than that, we are right now. That is true. Okay, all right. Hey, Roland, welcome back. Hey, hey, what's happening? <laughs> Not much, man. No, this is this is long, long awaited. I know we were we we're talking when we uh, kind of abruptly <laughs> ended the last episode with you. Remember, we're on a good tangent, and we're like, yeah, okay, round two is necessary, 100%. <laughs> well, let's just pick up right exactly where we left off. <laughs> should, we should have listened to that. We should have listened to the last five minutes of that episode so we know where we left off. Seriously. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> well, it did end up being one of our most popular episodes, uh, some top three. I know, although yeah. I did see you uh, say that it was recently surpassed by someone. Yeah, so I, I, th- I, I believe the Dennis Yu episode is slightly ahead, but not by a lot. Huh. Kurt Molly was coming right. after you too, so <laughs> but that's it's good company to be in <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so what's uh before we dig into things, uh, what's new in your in your world? Anything exciting? What happened? is new? Um, we have, I believe, since we talked, we've sold three companies Ooh. and we've bought two. So that's that's kind of fun. And then we've scheduled uh, our traffic and conversion summit now for. The next three years, 2020, 21, and 22 at the convention center in mm-hmm. San Diego. So that's a big move for us. Oh, that's Ooh, huge. They're going to be at the con- convention center now. Nice. Wow. Yeah, for, for 2020 on. And then um, we've uh, scheduled one in New York in September. Mm-hmm. And then next year we are committed to, so 2020 now is next year. We're committed to um, do one in Amsterdam and one in Singapore as well. And we're working on China if we can, if we can get that in. So that's been, that has all been fairly busy stuff. And uh, we've got some pretty cool strategic partnerships that we've, uh, that we've just formed with some rather big companies for uh, digital marketers. So that's exciting. And uh, that's very cool. You know, and the New York one, this is, this is the first time you've actually announced the New York one anywhere, right? We have, yeah, I haven't announced it anywhere. So we're, we haven't announced it to our list yet. We're, um, we haven't built a site for it yet or anything. <laughs> so we'll uh, hopefully within the next three or four weeks before TNC in San Diego this year, we will hopefully have all that up so that at TNC in San Diego, we can announce the New York one. That's awesome. very cool. Now, are there any concerns with having two in the same year in the same country? Do you think that'll affect attendance to like the San Diego one or anything like that? Well, it's funny because we thought that, um, but since we have now partnered with Clarion Events Mm -hmm. and um, they have um, endless research money and brilliance that we don't have, they actually did really extensive quantitative and qualitative surveys And um, because that's why we had not done it. We had actually contracted a few years ago to do TNC in Florida and we're going to try a TNC West, TNC East. Mm-hmm. And that's actually, we, we ended up, we put that off for as long as the hotel would allow us to in Orlando. And then we decided to do an event called content and commerce. So the reason that content and commerce was born was because we had space we had to take in Florida and we didn't want to just eat it. So mm. we figured we'd try that, but we didn't have the guts to try TNC over there. So these guys, when they came in and were doing all their due diligence, they wanted to see where was the first place that we should expand the event. And so they said uh, they did all the surveys and there was enough people that they reached out to who would not travel from the East Coast to the West Coast that um, it, it made total sense. So we're looking at it'll be maybe half as big the first year as the one in 
San Diego. So we're expecting about 3,500 people, but that's a, that's a pretty good start. And yeah. you know, they, they know what they're doing. So it'll be kind of cool. And then there are people who said, you know, well, we'll go to both of them as well. Of so, course. Yeah. You're always going to get the diehards and you had what, about 6,000 in San Diego last year, I believe it was. Yeah. And we're, we're fully sold out. So the reason that the, that the move to the convention center is we've already sold out of all our sponsor spaces and for, for 2019 and we are, uh, we'll, we'll end up selling out. So we'll, we'll be in the 7,000 ish people and that's like mm. bursting at the seams. So oh, yeah. we're excited to, to make that jump where we can get to 10,000, 12,000, 20,000 people in San Diego as we get, as we get that more space available. And it's yeah. really cool looking at the space. So walk, it's just giant going through the <laughs> convention center. You feel like just a little tiny ant compared to the hotels. So it's, it's going to be pretty cool. Did you ever see it actually head in that direction to something that large? Yeah. Um, I, I, we wanted to take it to the convention center for the last two or three years and we just, you know, it's, it's one of the nice things about partnering with somebody that knows what they're doing in that space is there were just, we could see that there were so many places that we could make a mistake that would cost us $200,000, like just, Oh, we forgot to ask for that. <laughs> and uh, so having somebody that has been there, done that is a, is a big deal. And, and having the extra capital to work with is pretty cool too. I think it's just really cool that you guys are going out there and partnering with a company who has that skill set. You know, they have the research, they have the budgets, they have uh, just all the systems kind of in place for you guys to leverage. And, you know, a lot of folks probably wouldn't think to do that, especially at your level. Is to yeah, it was, a, it was a real strategic decision for us. Uh, the, the, like we had several people that were interested in coming in as a partner and buying part of TNC, but we really wanted somebody that would help us expand the brand. And, um, and that knew what they were doing in the direction that we wanted. So these guys have been around since I think 1947 and they own 250 different events, huge events, uh, that they run all over the world. So they're very global friendly. They're very well capitalized. They're owned by Blackstone group, which is a $453 billion fund. Oh, wow. And they, <laughs> they've just got all this experience. They've got 2,500 employees. So it's kind of funny though, cause, um, Next month, we're all going over to London because now that's the headquarters of TNC is now London because mm -hmm. so, it's a UK company. So Got that's uh, that's kind of fun. Getting you out of San Diego and Austin, you know, just at the US period. That's uh, yeah. Yeah. And man, I always said, because, you know, we've been back to we were at the very first one in Austin. And, you know, it's just the evolution has been amazing. Yeah, I know we talked a lot about that in the last episode we did together. Mm -hmm. um, it's fascinating. I, I love to see the the growth. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. And I think the, one of the cool things is I, I try everything that I get involved in as an investor. Now I try to look for something that's got multiple company arms and multiple exit points. So the nice thing about coming in here is um, when I came in now, it's six years ago since we're in 2019. So when I came in as a partner, we had one company, Digital Marketer and our idea incubator that had Digital Marketer. And then we had this kind of like site for survival. And we had this event that digital marketer owned and looking at that and seeing that there were multiple points for, for exit was, was really cool. And building the, the goal of building up TNC and building up war room and building up digital marketer and then rival media, which is the one that has all of our websites and now Praxio and true conversion, uh, which are our software companies. It's, mm -hmm. it's really fun to watch that. And as they are, uh, this will be the, let's see, that was the TNC was the first. We have two right now that are in the middle of selling. We're in the middle of the, the deals have been struck and it's uh, in the documentation phase. Mm -hmm. So those will both close this month. So three of those six opportunities to exit will, you know, will have gone on. And then one of the other companies has been optioned. So it's pretty exciting <laughs> to see it down the road, your plan like actually working out the way you hope yeah. it would. <laughs> yeah. now, now, as as you guys are exiting some of these these various entities, how does that look for you know the the people behind the scenes that everybody's kind of has has seen all these years as the, the face of these brands, like the you know Ryan yeah, Dice and Perry and that you? That will continue for the foreseeable future. So for TNC, we we continue to program the content at TNC, uh, even though we sold a majority interest. We continue to be actively involved and our partners are interested in that because our skill set is the 
programming the content, finding the people, having the, the connections in the industry, being part of the industry ourselves, and feeding the, the content that really has helped take that event to, to where, it, you know, where it's been able to go. So we're still doing that. We're still helping with the marketing. We're still helping with the sponsorship sales and that sort of stuff. And they're helping with the things that they're really good at. So that's, that's what makes a great partnership, right? Is having people that have two different skill sets that are complementary, not overlapping. Mm, yeah. Now with the multiple points of exit, that's, that's kind of fascinating because, you know, we, everybody talks about exiting a company, scaling, you're great at that, but the multiple exit points is even cooler. Is, uh, is that something you plan for typically in the very beginning or is that uh, something you just kind of fall into or, you know, I, I'm sure I, it's by I, design. I, I did not, I fell into it and then realized that it was, it was definitely the way to go. So right now I'm buying a real estate company or buying into uh, a real estate company and the real estate company is, it's, you know, on the ink list, it's one of the fastest growing in its category in the country and um and it's got really good operators but what i like about it is that i'm again buying into the holding company and so while part of it is a real is a um retail brokerage it also has a mortgage company an escrow company mm -hmm. <laughs> a um a title company and several other assets that are all fed by that core asset just like digital marketer was feeding all of its other assets. So right. I like that. So I know that my investment is a good one, but if something happens to any one of those companies, you still have all the others. And I know that there are buyers for them. So when I invest, I want to know who's my buyer in the end, and I'll actually go and talk to the buyers. And sometimes I'll find that the that, that there isn't a sale. Like I thought there would be for uh, a SaaS company that I was offered the opportunity to participate in as an owner. And um, it's, it's a great company and it's doing well and it has lots of customers and good revenue and all that. But when I went to the people who would be the buyers, and it was two or three of them that I talked to, they all said that they would pass on it. And the reasons they gave me were it's, it's in, it doesn't have uh, paid media customer acquisition. It's in, the, in an industry, it's too small in an industry with too dominant a player, et cetera, et cetera. So that was really good because that let me go back and give great feedback to the people who had offered me the opportunity to come in. Mm -hmm. But it also kept me from spending my time investing a couple of years to find out that I really couldn't sell the thing, right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's super interesting. So with um, w when you're going and, and considering buying a company or mm -hmm. investing into a company, is that part of your process to actually go and, and find out you know, what the potential exit plan is and talk to those potential buyers before you get absolutely. involved. Man. Absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. Uh, I love that. Cause I remember at the mastermind. Yeah, so yeah, so I just did it too. We had, um, we, we just partnered with Brenda Burchard on experts Academy mm -hmm. and, um, and before doing that, I went and talked to the people that would be the buyer for that. And, um, because that was the whole goal. And that was one of the reasons he wanted to partner uh, with us was because we have that skill set. And so we talked about, we talked about what the plan was, the plan for growth, the events, the different sides of the business. And then um, I went and talked to a couple of the potential buyers and had a great conversation with them and said, you know, this, this is, this is where it is now. This is what our plan is. Is that something you'd be interested in? They said, absolutely positively. So that's, that gives me that confirmation. Now I know I've got a goal that when I get to that goal, I can exit. I've got a buyer who's interested and excited that I've talked to them. So they they keep an eye on the business, right? And then we feed them the metrics. So it, it really, really helps. And it motivates, you know, motivates our partner in Brendan or, and the other people in the other businesses that we get into to know that we've got a set of goals and we're all working towards those goals. And then when we hit those goals, we've got a big payday. Hmm. So do you actively communicate with these folks, you know, in, after you invest in the company, after you get their verbal agreement, I mean, is there a contract there or some light no. agreement? No. no, no, no contract. Cause, okay. cause you don't want to be constrained and they wouldn't want to either, right. you know, cause things don't always go the way you hope they would, but hmm. it, it, uh, it just really makes sense to me that you, 
it with anything, with any goal. If you set goals for, for this year, right? We're just going into the new year as we record this. If you set goals for the end of the year or three years from now or whatever, you need to know what are the steps along the way, but you need to know that, that that's, that's actually possible. Mm. And so I think if you, if you can reverse engineer and start with the end in mind and talk to your buyer and say, Hey, what does it look like for you to acquire this company? And they say, well, we actually would be interested in, you know, here are the terms, then that's very helpful. Yeah. And also sometimes going to, uh, going to a potential buyer leads, uh, leads to an unexpected early sale. We, we just did that with, uh, one of our war room members, uh, who we partnered up to approach a company that they wanted to acquire. And that company ended up coming back and saying, well, actually, we're in the middle of being acquired by this private equity fund who, who we happen to know because uh, we dealt with them before. And, they, and then they said, but we'd actually like, they'd actually like to buy your company. <laughs> so we ended, up, uh, we ended up helping him and we're in the middle of it now sell his company. So it's, it's, it's really funny how that world works. Yeah. And I can, I can imagine, yeah, like I'm just going to role play really quick here. Like say if, for instance, you know, we went to say digital marketer and be like, Hey, digital marketer, what would it take to buy evergreen profits? You know, and, mm -hmm. and, and nowhere near now, but just, I bet you're probably going to get, or we would get some pretty dang good feedback from you guys. Well, you'd probably Absolutely. help us with almost like a roadmap of, okay, here's where we yeah. need to get to it if we wanted to sell this thing. Exactly. Correct. Absolutely. And so that that's all falls under something called exit planning. And it's very, very good to go through that exercise. That's, you know, that, that that's the thing I do an intensive on. So right. I have a two day intensive I do on leveraging, growing, scaling and exiting. And my goal in doing that is to provide great information for people who want to find out all the steps to that. But also it, it <laughs> it's a way for me to find companies that are interested in it that sure. we might be interested in buying. I think it's brilliant, the whole model there. How are the intensives going? Are they going strong still? Yeah, really good. It, it's, been, it, it's been a fun adventure kind of uh, learning and growing and trying different things, but it's, it's absolutely something that will continue to be uh, a valuable piece for lead and customer generation for, different, for all of our different businesses. We're doing them now in, the, uh, in several different verticals. We have them in the digital marketing space and the real estate mm -hmm. space and the consulting space and the chiropractic space. We're in the process of doing one in the automotive space. Wow. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And that's another high leverage, multiple exit, you know, who knows what opportunities are going to come of those. I would imagine. Exactly. Now, yeah. now from a, like a business operational standpoint, do you recommend that businesses kind of look at all of their, their various assets and figure out ways to sort of segment them so that they can break them off and sell them? Yeah, I, I think it's really smart, uh, and it, and this is something that I just kind of bumbled my way into realizing, as as most hopeful great discoveries happen. But the the thing that I learned in the traffic and conversion sale was that because of how we had structured the company, we were able to continue to have our momentum in all of our other companies. So we were able to spin that off and sell it, and get a you know get a nice payday from it and get a great partner that will help us go forward. But we also got an indirect benefit, like a direct benefit that we knew was that if we only sold TNC because digital marketer and war room and Praxio, our LMS and true conversion, our um, analytics software all exhibit at TNC and we're and are critical parts of our business and we are a critical part of TNC that all of the additional expansion into all those other markets like New York and Singapore and the Netherlands and so on and so forth, that, that TNC brand will carry all of those brands along with it to all of those people who we will be reaching effectively for free. Like that's mm. just a, an ancillary benefit because our brands are being carried by one of the brands that we sold and the finances of the partner who is, you know, who is expanding that brand. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, they all have their own arms. They have these like influence. It's, it's a ripple effect that's going along. It is, it, but it's a giant piggybacking uh, as, as a result of that. So that's, that's a pretty cool yeah. side effect of that. And having the momentum of having each of those pieces still exist. This is the second part is, 
that we like we still have our media company. So I, I would break up if I think about acquisitions, there are really seven different categories of company that you might think about acquiring, which also leads you to say, well, these are the seven categories that I might think about in my business. One is competitors. So that's the easy one Mm -hmm. is you can grow your business super fast by buying a competitor, buy a competitor that has the same or more customers than you and you instantly double your business fastest way. Can't think of a faster, but also you can buy media companies and media can be blogs, websites, Facebook groups, YouTube accounts can be anything, but anything that is a place that has content that attracts your customer demographic psychographic. Yep. You can buy companies for teams like we bought uh, True Conversion so that we could have the software development team. And then that team was able to help us with lots of other software that we wanted to develop. You can buy people who are vendors of services or people who are vendors of products to either you, your company, or your customers and instantly find an additional income stream, customer generation stream, et cetera, mm-hmm. right? You can buy the supply chain, either up the chain as manufacturing all the way down to distribution channels, or you can buy IP. So mm-hmm. those are the seven types of categories that I start thinking about when I'm looking at acquiring a company. So what are the vendors? Let's, let's use the real estate company. What's, what's the media company? Well, they don't really have a media company right now. So that makes sense for us to go and acquire some. We're looking at acquiring large Facebook groups that attract brokers so that we can get more brokers because we know if we get more brokers uh, working under us, then our company becomes more valuable. It has more revenue. It has more transactions. Mm -hmm. As we get more brokers from that media, it makes sense for us to look at other services and products that those brokers would want. So that's why you have a title company, an escrow company, et cetera, because those are natural companies that we could buy that we can then feed our, we can feed with our existing uh, network of brokers. When we want to acquire additional teams, we can go out and buy a company that does say transaction processing or accounting or something like that, that can be then provided to our brokers. Supply and distribution not as not as much opportunity there in that particular space. And then IP, for sure, hmm. we go out and buy other software and things like that that we can make available to our broker community. Then all of those different categories uh, become areas of acquisition, but also become potential areas of disposition when we go to sell. Does that make sense? Definitely. That, that makes sense. I love that list. And I, I think our brains are, are spinning right now. I'm curious, when you when you go to acquire a business, how how would you typically structure uh, pur- purchasing a business to essentially bring the assets into your business? Well, it, it depends. It depends on what, what we're buying. Like if I'm buying if I'm buying cold into a new industry, like, like with that real estate, I typically want 20 to 50%. I don't Mm. want less than 20 because it has to be worth, it has to be worth your time. Mm. And it takes just as much effort to, to go through the process of acquiring and building a company, uh, with, you know, with 20% as it does 50. And so Mm. I want, I want to know, and and it also has to be big enough because if Mm. it's like this company, I think the last year sales were 85 million, right? So, I want a company that can get to a hundred million as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. So it's because my time, if I, if I'm leveraging my time and thinking about my return, if I own 20% of a company that can sell for a hundred million, I can make $20 million. If I own 20% of a company that's going to sell for 10 million, I make $2 million. That's nice. But I mean, if you think about for three or five years of my time, I, I want to make a lot more money than that. Well, so sure. I'm, I, I, you think about the effort that it takes, you know, in, in generating what you're going to get. So I typically will look at 20 to 50% on the acquire side. And I don't want to acquire more than 50% because I want my partners to be equally motivated towards the payday that's going to come when they exit. Mm-hmm. When we're buying a company for a company that we already own in the industry we already own. So like if digital marketer, we, we just acquired a company called OMI, the Online Marketing Institute, mm-hmm. uh, digital marketer acquired that company. So we acquired 100% of that company because that company is going to be folded in as a subsidiary of the digital marketer group of companies. When we bought the software company, True Conversion, we bought 100% of it for that reason. So in that case, 
we typically want to buy at least 80%. And, um, and that's if somebody's going to stay on and operate in the future because we want them to have a vested interest. But, um, but sometimes we'll buy 100%. Yeah. So, so with, so for the, for our listeners that are listening to this show that may not, you know, the, the, the size of their business is probably not quite the size of digital marketer in most cases. How would, mm-hmm. how would somebody go about, you know, investigating buying a company to, um, you know, to, to get their existing customers or to buy the IP? Do you suggest something like owner financing or going and raising capital from external sources or, you know, what, what sort of advice would you give somebody who goes, this is really good, but I don't, I don't yep. have capital in the bank to do this kind of thing. Yep. Uh, well, uh, there's, so I like to buy companies with no money down. There's eight ways to do that as well. <laughs> so I, I think about whatever the size of the company that you are right now, if you're a small company and you're only doing a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars a year, then you can still find in each of those seven categories, competitors that are doing less than that, or maybe up to say five times that, yeah. that are, that are actually viable. So five times a hundred would be 500,000 to a million dollar competitor, five, five to 10 times. Right. Mm. Um, but, but there's so many smaller assets like blogs. Let's say that you just want to own all of the keywords in your niche. Well then go find out all the blogs who are, or Facebook groups or LinkedIn groups or whatever that are ranking for those keywords that are your key keywords and start buying them. And you'll find like we buy, we bought a, 250,000 plus member, very active Facebook group for $1,500. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's not a lot, right? We're in the middle of buying one for real estate right now for about that same amount of money. And, and that's an easy way to access a ton of customers that, that, um, that are, are potential customers that you would never have accessed before. And that would have cost you a hell of a lot more than that. Had you gone out and acquired them with pay-per-click, let's say the, the average lead, let's say, cost you, or the average click for a lead cost you um, a dollar. Mm-hmm. If it's only a dollar that it costs and you bought something that has uh, 100,000 members in it, then you just got $100,000 worth of leads for $500 or $1,500. That's, that's the way to think about it. So it scales up and down the chain easily. Does that make sense as, as the first step? It, it resonates so well right now because this has been the exact theme of the day. Uh, we were having this conversation at lunch about going and we were actually talking in, in reference to Instagram accounts, but we were mm-hmm. having this, this conversation at lunch about going and buying up influencer Instagram accounts so that we can leverage yep. them to for their audience. Yeah. So, so you want interactivity and ideally not guru specific personality specific right. accounts so you would you would Topical. much rather have somebody that was in the hustle and flow kind of area of instagram and had a non-name account like an account not named after a person but maybe you know more efficiency or something like that right, right. and um and so instagram accounts youtube accounts facebook groups linkedin groups meetup groups uh, blog accounts, websites, all of those would be, would be things to think about in that area. And that's just media. Mm-hmm. So then you go to team. Well, gosh, I can't find anybody who programs. Then go buy a software company. Go buy somebody like we did that, that's, got, that's already got the team. And you might be shocked at how much you can get them for. Our initial end to almost all of the categories of everything we've bought has been zero or as little as uh, well, I'd say most of them are zero, but sometimes I think we bought our software company um, with a deferred initial payment of ten thousand dollars towards a hundred thousand dollar payment, ten thousand dollars a month. But we were able to generate the money to pay for it mm-hmm. from that list instantly, so we didn't really have to come out of pocket at all, right? Oh my so god! <laughs> that's like that's what you want to think about. And same thing with with uh, adding additional products and services or getting products and services that your customers will be able to buy or having your offer be available to other product and service vendors who have the customers who should be buying your product too. That's why you go out and find other service companies and product companies. And same thing, you just, it's, it's, you can go as small as you want to what you can afford. Now let's talk about how do you pay for it? Well, the easiest way to pay for it, if you've ever, if you guys have ever bought real estate for no money down, Either of you? Uh, not no money down. No. No. Okay. 
have you ever bought it for not a lot of money down? Yes. I've done, I've done like that. FHA okay. 3% down, but <laughs> Okay. Great. Well, so so that's a that's that's a good example. Have you ever done seller financing? No, I no, no. I did a little bit of that. Yes. I have done that. Okay, yeah. great. So so it's this like in a company, it's just like buying real estate with seller financing. You get the seller to finance the company. So all of the companies that we have I'm trying to think, all of the companies that we have bought in the last 12 months have been some form of seller financed deal. Hmm. So in the seller finance deal, you don't need a bank. You're getting the person that you're buying the company from to effectively loan you the money to buy their company. And then if you do it right, you're having the company pay for itself Hmm. from the money that it's already making. So you've got seller financing, you've got earnouts, which is you can't agree on a price now because the seller says they want X. And you want to pay X divided by a hundred, mm-hmm, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. So, so they want three million dollars for it, or three hundred thousand dollars for it, and you want to pay thirty thousand dollars for it. And they say, "Oh, but it's going to do all this great stuff." So you simply put a formula in and say, "Tell you what, if it does as well as you say, then I'll absolutely pay you that." But you have to consider the law of price and terms, and. To the best of my knowledge, there is no law of price and terms, but I like to talk about it when I'm negotiating. (laughs) So you say, look, the law of price and terms says that you can get any price you want if the terms are good enough. Mm -hmm. But if you want terms that are 100% cash payment right now, then the price is going to be significantly lower. So which do you want? Well, I want the price. Fantastic. I can pay you a million dollars for that thing if I can pay you a dollar a year for a million years. And that's that's... (laughs) obviously a hyperbolic example, but right. So I can say, if you want $300,000 for, for your company, that's cool. Um, I can pay you $10,000 a year for 30 years because I only think it's worth Mm $10,000. And then that's your point for negotiation. But so that that's the price and terms argument. Now you get to earn out and you say, so if you believe that it's going to do all these numbers, after we take over magically and those numbers that you're thinking are the hockey stick that seems to never happen, but I'm not going to tell you that it's not, (laughs) uh, then you have to put your money where your mouth is and say that you'll agree that as long as the company hits these numbers, then we'll pay you that amount that you want. But if it doesn't, then the amount's going to be less and you agree on a formula for it. You can also do a um, asset-based lending deal. So I was talking about that earlier. If they've got any kind of assets. They've got purchase orders, accounts receivable, hard assets, leased assets, anything that you can get financed from some bank or outside source, uh, then you can use those assets to come up with the money to pay for it. Hmm. You can do uh, self-liquidating payments where you buy the company based on what the payments you know will the company will carry. So you basically do your financing with your seller, let's say that your agreement is to pay $10,000 a month, but you know that you can generate $10,000 a month instantly just by plugging that company into your existing assets, then that's an easy deal for you to do because you know it pays for itself right away. So you simply say, I'm going to pay you $10,000 a month. I'm going to pay the first one 30 days deferred. So that deferral allows you to generate money from the company before you have to pay money to buy the company. Does that make sense? Yeah, you can get your ducks in a row, maybe you know, yep. get whatever marketing system you need to do it and go. You got 30 yep. days. And then we do, we do baseline deals where we say, I tell you what, I want to buy the company. Uh, I want to buy into the company. This is usually for buying in, not buying 100%. So I want to buy 50% of your company. Um, right now, it's making a million dollars a year profit. The first million dollars that comes in, you continue to keep. And then we split 50-50 anything over that because we're going to come in and sprinkle our magic pixie dust on it. And um, and then um, and then uh, when we sprinkle our magic pixie dust on it, it's going to do two million dollars. So you'll take the first million and then we'll split the million 50-50 on what on that extra profit. And those are kind of fun deals to do. Mm -hmm. Then you can do a modified baseline deal, which is which I highly recommend where you say, so here's the deal though, on the, that first million that you're keeping, when we've three times, and this is the number I usually use, it ranges between three and five, mm-hmm. but uh, three is the most common. Say so when we've three times the profit, then we're just 50-50 on everything. Mm. 
So that's, that's another way. Then we have pipe wrench offers where you're providing say 10% or more of another company's business in terms of leads. And you go to them and you just say, look, I'm, I'm really building your business right now. And I'm, I'm thinking that I love you and I mean it, Mm -hmm. but I want, if I'm going to build your brand, I want to own part of it. So I'll tell you what, let's do a deal. If you, if you're willing to give me X percent equity in your company, then I'll continue to provide those leads. But if you're not, then I'm either going to start my own business that does that, or I'm going to go to some else, someone else who will give me equity in their company. And that's, that's again, a no money deal because you're saying, I just, you're going to give me equity in your company. And people are typically happy to do that because they're worried that you'll take your business elsewhere and it'll dr- dramatically adversely impact their business. So they're willing to give you equity in their company. Plus, they know that if you now have a vested interest in sending business to them, that you'll probably send two or three times the amount of business that you were sending. Before. Sure. So those are, those are just a few no money down ways. So I, this like eight of them, uh, and I think that was maybe five or six that, that <laughs> we use on the regular basis to buy companies and, and for no money out of pocket. And I'll tell you, like last year, one of the companies we bought was a $5 million company that had been around for, 30 years. Another company we bought was a 20 year old company that had been around uh, that had uh, about $2 million a year in income. So it's, it's possible to do no money down deals with actual real live functioning, profitable existing companies. You don't Mm -hmm. have to buy losers to, to, to do that. And when you're buying media companies, um, typically the people that are running those blogs and Facebook groups and Insta accounts they're not making any money or whatever they're making. You can easily do a baseline deal where you say, okay, you're making uh, $25,000 a year selling your t-shirts on your Instagram account. That's awesome. You continue to do that. I'll give you 100% of your t-shirt revenue ad infinitum forever. And um, all I want is the rights to do everything else. And you continue to do what you're doing. So now you don't have to replace them, which Mm -hmm. is great. They are motivated because it's any money they get is going to be found money and then cut them in for 10, 20, 30% of what the extra that you're able to generate is. So there's a million ways to do those deals. That seems like a no brainer right there for anyone yep. to just experiment with. Just go look. Absolutely. At- and, and you know what? It's a, it's a numbers game, right? It's, yeah. you, it's, yeah. you got to just, it's like dating. You just got to ask enough people <laughs> until you find the right one. Now, are you ever just like given equity in companies because of the platform that you have already and because of your name recognition and like, you know, kind of like advisory shares in a company just because they know now I have some attachment to digital marketer and, and your existing brand? Yes. Last month we were given uh, 50% of a $7 million a year company and 25% of a $12 million a year company for nothing just to have us involved. And this that's exactly why we are so big on podcasting and building our brand and our platform and what we call our megaphone. <laughs> right. Right. It's for yeah, stuff like absolutely. that. Absolutely. I mean, you look at someone like like a Tim Ferriss who gets, you know, in the tens of millions of download a month on his podcast, he can go on there and he can mention a product name and it'll sell out on Amazon the next day. And, Correct. You know, and and that's why we put so much focus on on brand and that sort of mm-hmm. thing. Did you did you have something? Well, I was just gonna say, uh, Roland, you win the Wicked Smart Award again <laughs> <laughs> for all of that stuff you just said. Because I know we're going to create a little episode companion, and that's going mm-hmm. to be like probably one of the hottest downloaded items right there. <laughs> At least it will be Fantastic. for me. Yeah. So thank you. So uh, I guess eat, eat that, Dennis. You and Kurt Malley. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I guess my, my next question would be, you know, what, what happens after you've acquired a business? Like how often does the people running the business stay on board versus how often do you install a team? And, and what does that process look like? You know, it usually is driven by the, the seller. So if the seller is interested in staying on and is going to be a, an integral part of the continuing value of what we plan to do with the company, then we want them to stay on. Frequently, the seller just wants out. They're tired of it or they, you know, they've got some other project. It's probably the most common thing is that they've got the uh, squirrel syndrome. So they've <laughs> seen another, pro- another project that they would rather leave their currently profitable 
perfectly fine business to go start something new that's not yet proven <laughs> and is making no money. You know, that's oh, yeah. our typical entrepreneurial bent, right? Yes, so uh, usually they don't stay on, but once in a while you'll have somebody who's a really good operator and who is interested in a long-term partnership. And that that's, I'd say probably 10% of the time, but um, it's something that we definitely like when we find, because as you know, good people are really hard to find. Mm -hmm. So are you, are you like shifting people around from other areas and other businesses into these new businesses that you acquire? Are you going in and bringing in all completely new staff when you go and acquire something? I have a team of people uh, that I've built up over the years that I work with that are good strategic people in each of the core areas of operations of companies. So I'll usually bring that team or someone, some part of that team along for whatever is needed. And the idea is that they'll be there temporarily, and then we will find someone that will be a full-time person there if if that skill set doesn't already exist in the company we're acquiring. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I just remember going back to one of the masterminds we were in. We asked you a question about software development, and you said you can either build it or buy it. And that just yep. stuck in my head, and that's exactly what all this whole conversation is about. And I, yeah, exactly. It seems like buying it is more the way to go based on what we're, we're understanding. <laughs> well, here are the strategies to buy with no money down, creative financing or deal structure with exit in mind. Multiple. Well, at the very least, even yep. if you are going to build a software, what I'm kind of getting from this conversation is you can go and find somebody who has an existing software. It may not necessarily be the software you're hoping to develop, but you buy the software company to get the development team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly what we did with True Conversion. We, we did not know how to develop software. We wanted to build DMHQ. Buying True Conversion got us a software development team to, you know, to, to get us started. And then we were able to go out and find some really brilliant people to add to that. But we weren't starting cold, not knowing what the heck we were doing. Got it. Okay. I just think it's, it's I don't think there's any faster way to get into a business you want to get into that you're not in now or to grow your business than to buy another one that already has what you want. Yeah. And that's, and that's, that's, I know our struggle, at least Matt and I, you know, you, you almost get into bad, not bad habits, but uh, habits in general. And, you know, we're good at driving traffic ads, audience building that way. But then sometimes just gloss over the fact that, Hey, someone did all this hard work already. <laughs> let's right. just use that right. time. And now let's go locate them and do exactly what you just laid out here. And exactly. Just totally skip everything. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, unless you have something else on this topic, I wanted to, I'm going to kind of totally shift gears because I want to talk about your podcast before we run out of time. So <laughs> with, with your podcast, um, what, uh, um, what was the idea behind it? Why did you decide to add a podcast into the mix? I uh, have wanted to do it forever. And I, I just want to share, I have so much stuff that I discover in my travels of, you know, of life that I just think is really cool that I want to share. And I really like helping other business people. And I've wanted to start it for ever since they came out with it, <laughs> however many years ago it was, <laughs> and have been really behind the curve on it because of the time that I thought it would take, because I really also hate schedules. I don't <laughs> want to be, I don't want to have to be any place all the time on Tuesday at this time right. or whatever, right? I hate that kind of thing. I, I'm happy to make an appointment, although even when I make an appointment uh, two weeks out, I start to dread that I have to go to that appointment <laughs> and I don't know why. But um, but so I had, for three different times, I had identified all the best equipment and bought it and set it up in a little corner of my house and was all set to go and then never would go over there and would look at it and go, nah, it doesn't, that sounds horrible. I don't want to have to do that. And then I'd give it away to my kids, give all the equipment away. <laughs> so when I started doing the Facebook, when I started recording videos on my iPhone of takeaways from my actual business meetings and posting them on Facebook, John Reese called me and said, you're an idiot. You should do a podcast. And I was like, well, I don't want to do a podcast because I've bought the equipment three times and I've sold it and I'm never going to be at one place. And he's like, no, no, no. He's like, just do it whenever you want to do it. He said, that's, and I'm like, yeah, but you know, an hour of content. He's like, no, do it five minutes. If you want to do it five minutes. And I was like, okay, he just, and, and so what he said was, he said, you already have the content in your meetings that you're doing for Facebook, but you're showing it to people one time for the minute that they're in your Facebook feed before the cat videos and everything else takes over. And then it's buried and nobody's going to ever see any of that. At least if you do a podcast, 
there'll be an archive of all of the stuff that people can uh, find and look at and listen to and benefit from. And I was like, yeah, that, that actually makes sense. So my idea to do the podcast was so that all of the content that I've been creating through all of these meetings, when I go and have lunch with people and stuff like that, could actually sit in a place where people could access it, look it up, and it wouldn't disappear forever into the bowels of Facebook. Now, in doing that, in, in actually getting it launched, what I realized was that I kind of wanted to, to dive a little bit deeper into the stories of the people who I was having lunch with. And it was called, my wife named it Business Lunch because I was like, I don't know what to call it. And she's <laughs> like, well, you basically have business lunches with people. So why don't you call it Business Lunch? And then I looked up the domain and it was like, I think 2000 bucks. And I was like, okay, I'm going to buy that. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, as I, as I started getting into that, I was like, I really want people to see the mindset behind not like we have a tactical podcast called perpetual traffic. We have a behind the scenes podcast called digital marketer. But what, what I wanted to do was really like, if you sit down with people who are really successful, they think a certain way. And, and if you look at the evolution of their thinking and their career, you can see clues that maybe are common to all of them that you could learn from. And so I wanted to be able to share with people the actual thought processes throughout the evolution of some of these successful entrepreneurs so that people could see and benefit from the way they think. And it's really interesting uh, reading the reviews that came in. I got a, you know, a whole bunch of reviews to start with. Yeah. And um, the ones that were negative, which I, I'm cons- I think three stars is the worst so far, but the, I definitely consider average negative. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the three star said, well, this person, I, I had interviewed JJ Virgin. They said, well, JJ Virgin just bragged the whole time. Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, that's so not the takeaway. Mm. The takeaway is what you get from listening to JJ Virgin and Todd Herman and, you know, uh, Gary Vanyerchuk and Richard Branson and everybody, you know, Ryan Dice, all the people, Frank Kern, all of them are very humble people Mm -hmm. and they're very customer focused. They're very concerned about what they're doing for the customer and they don't have the ego of like, like JJ and Todd Herman and a couple other folks were like the very first group that they ever got in front of either heckled them or some of the people walked out in the middle of them talking, or they only had four people Hmm. to talk to. Like the, the whole Todd Herman was talking about uh, helping a sports team and everybody walked out except four people. Wow. But he stayed there and he helped those four people. And that ultimately led him to a, I think a $700,000 book advance for a first time author, right? That's, that, that is that service ethic and that, that being there to serve the customer and the stick to and the put your ego in a box and the continue to challenge yourself. Like JJ talked about, well, when I first, I first, I wanted to get on the New York Times, I wanted to write a book. Then I wanted to write a book and get on the New York Times bestseller list. Then when I got on the New York Times bestseller list, I wanted to get on as the number one. And then I wanted to get multiple number ones. It's like Hmm. over and over setting those really high goals and higher than what you've ever done before. You see in all these people that I interact with and I wanted that, that to be shared out there so people could get these mindset, strategic and tactical things that, that wherever you are in your entrepreneurial journey, if you're just starting out, you get to hear how they started out. So you can say, oh, okay, I see from these seven people, I can do these things and, and I can make it. Even though, I'm, don't, even though I have no list and nobody knows me and I have no money or anything, I can do that. Or I'm a super successful multi 10 times decim, you know, millionaire, best-selling author, et cetera, but I can do this to go even further. So my goal was to try to try to have something across that full uh, entrepreneurial journey that anybody could look and take any part of that and draw some value from it. Mm, I love that. And this actually, you hit on something about goal setting. I wrote this down earlier in a converse, in the in this conversation. I want to ask you about how you do yours, but also some commonalities. But before that, really quick, I just love that you are 
because you are the example of what you're putting out there to the world in the podcast. You know, the fact oh, that you, you give away your best stuff everywhere. So, yes. um, yeah, that's hats off to you for that. Uh, but going back to, have you found any good commonalities of the podcast you've already done of how they set goals kind of in the beginning of the year here? Uh, um, of, of how they set goals, I, I would say that um, the goal setting is is it, it is a active, integral part of their life. So they are writing down, they're all writing down goals that challenge themselves to new levels of success and they're pushing themselves to achieve those goals uh, no matter how successful they are they're not resting on their laurels they're not being self-satisfied they're saying i want to get to the next place and the reason they want to get to the next place isn't so they can make more money it isn't so they can be more famous it's so that they can help more people hmm. like consistently more and more and more, I, I am seeing also that with great levels of success come very, very deep levels of service and planning and intentionality and thoughtfulness. That There's a program on Netflix right now called Seven Days Out mm. that is uh, awesome because it studies seven days out of the Kentucky Derby, seven days out of the opening of one of my favorite restaurants, which just in 2017 got best restaurant in the world, uh, 11 Madison Park in New York City. And there's a Chanel show and other things. And so they start seven days out. And all of these people who are just wildly successful, who I see on that show, who I interview, who, you know, who we come across in, in our travels, they think so deeply about everything. Like in that, in that show, they wanted to be the best restaurant in the world. So they took the time to tailor suits for the waiters and, and, um, and servers and to sit on every seat in the restaurant and say, this seat is too pointy on the material is too rough on the back. We need to soften this material. When I put my feet down, one of my feet sits on a leg of the table. So we're going to have to turn all the table legs to do that. Uh, when you look at some of the best architecture in the world, I was in Russia a few months ago and there's this, um, Church of the Spilled Blood, where one of the czar's uh, fathers was assassinated. And so the czar decided to build this monument. And the care that went into it was so deep that the dome that is over the, um, over the exact spot where the father was killed is 93 meters high because he was killed in 1893. And the one in the center is 61 meters high because he was 61 when he died. Like wow. that kind of depth of thought mm. behind every really great business, every really great piece of architecture, every really great accomplishment. It is so much greater than the depth of thought that the average person puts into their business, their building their life. Right. Mm. And so seeing that again and again in all of those environments is really a big takeaway for me from the last year. And sorry, I, I digressed a little bit, mm. but like in terms of goal setting, then think about how can you be the best in the world? How can you go beyond the surface that you've been scratching to go 10 times deeper to provide a better experience, to provide a better product, a better service, uh, a better outcome for your customer. Mm, I love that. And Seven Days Out, by the way, is an amazing documentary or sh right? short, whatever. Yeah, I saw I just, the. I made a note of it. I've never heard of it until just now. <laughs> Kentucky Derby, when I watched that the other night, I was like, whoa, oh my God. It's pretty great. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, it's also scary. Like, if you watched, like, a lot of them. It's you're never gonna finish this in seven God, days. No. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that's amazing. I'll watch more of them. Um, and how about your own goal setting? Is it very similar? And maybe it's not a specific, you know, like planning the year, but maybe planning a specific business because I know you're involved in so many of them. Uh, um, I I do categories. So I do um, physical relationship business professional, which I consider different from business because I think business is the specific businesses I have goals. Uh, for them in terms of customer service, finance, uh, KPIs, and things like that. But then professionally, I want to develop myself 
professionally as a business person, but I also want to develop myself personally as a business, as a human being. So I, I set goals across all those finances, obviously, across all those different categories. And then I look at the end of the year and I say, at the end of the year, 12 months from now, as I'm setting my goals for the next year, where do I want to have come in all of these areas? And I'll write that down. And that's my end result goal. And they're very specific in all of those areas. And then I will reverse engineer what do I have to do at, in each month to have gotten myself to that goal. Like I, six months in, I better be at point X if I want to get to point X times two, right? Mm-hmm. So that reverse engineering process, I think, is, is a critical process to chunk the goals down into small chunks to say, where do you need to be? And then have those leading indicators of, am I on track? And if I'm not, then I better do something pretty significant to get myself on sure. track. Yeah. Maybe you have to go acquire a new Instagram page or something to boost up your traffic or whatever. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I and it. I like to set big, hard to get goals too. I like to be very challenged. Yeah. Both. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming both financially, maybe it's physically all everything. Yeah. Even stupid stuff. Like I, one of my goals for 2018, which I just uh, barely squeaked in <laughs> was I wanted to speak at an internet marketing party because I find like I don't go out. I'm I'm not an extrovert. Like I like people, but I am not like a super go to the bar and I you know go around and I know everybody and talk to everybody and all that kind of stuff. If I'm in a bar and I don't know anybody, I'm in the corner having my drink, waiting to get the heck out of there. <laughs> and so, the internet marketing party is the opposite of anything I would ever totally <laughs> like like to put myself in the middle of. It, it's great for people that like it. it. It's a really cool thing. It's just, it's not my thing. So <laughs> it's uncomfortable for me. So one of my goals was that I wanted to speak at the internet marketing party because it would be incredibly uncomfortable for me and that would be a good experience. So, <laughs> so like I have goals like that too. And I did it and it actually worked out really well. Um, and it was, it, I, people paid attention, which was shocking because I'd watched a lot of videos of, you know, I, I know when I saw uh, Frank Kern speak, yep a few years ago in San Diego <laughs> and I was originally scheduled to speak. Um, but he ended up speaking and like he was having drinks at the bar and then he went over in this corner and got on the microphone yep. and everybody's like talking and he was like just surrounded by people. And I was like, that seems super horribly uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. We were at I've that got to do that. <laughs> yeah. We were there. We saw that. And I remember it being a little awkward looking. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, the ones in the ones in San Diego, I, th- I feel like the speakers aren't quite as organized. But when they do it in Austin, I because we went to we've been to a couple in Austin. When they do the IM parties mm-hmm. in Austin, they're I feel <laughs> like the people pay attention to the speakers a little more out in Austin for whatever reason. <laughs> Who knows? But, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the people were very kind. Kind that I I got their attention for the whole time. I did it though. What I decided as I was going in is I was like, how can I actually connect with this crowd in a way that will be fun and good for them and everything, and so. I did, um, I did business growth in five toasts. So I was mm. like, at the end of each of my five points, I, I made it very short. I, I think it was like 18 minutes long instead of you know 30 or 45, because that's a long time to have to pay mm-hmm. attention to somebody in a bar. Yeah. And then eat, at the end of each, say, three-minute segment when I made a point, I said, so here's to this or whatever, and raised my drink with everybody else, and we all took a drink. So it was kind of fun. Yeah. And... Um, and I actually, you know, actually had a good time, even though it wasn't something I would normally do. <laughs> you actually you had always a good have time. to be personally growing by putting yourself outside of the places that you would be very comfortable and get yourself uncomfortable in a good, healthy, growing kind of way. Yeah. yeah and I know, I, yeah, and you were, I know you're on stage. I think it was the side stage, but uh, at TNC. Well, you've been on the big stage, obviously. Um, huh? but yeah. Yeah. So any more speaking appearances coming soon or? Uh, I'm speaking at an entrepreneurs organization group in Fort Worth and then, um, another one in Macau. I've got one in Israel. I've got one in Fiji. Wow. And then, um, I've got TNC obviously in San Diego and New York. And, uh, our war room is in Punta Mita, Mexico at the end of this month. So those are all, Got yeah, quite, up. quite a yeah. bit. I, I enjoy, I enjoy speaking and, um, I, I think it's a great way to connect with a whole lot of people. And I'm really focused on 
going towards like goals and partnerships and all the stuff that we talked about. I'm really focused on getting connected with the 12,500 roughly people in entrepreneurs organization who are my exact customer uh, demographic and the 25,000 people who are in uh, YPO. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are two really big goals for me this year. Yeah, I was going to say, I was actually going to ask you, what's what's like one challenging 2019 goal that you feel like you're going to have to stretch for? Uh, one of our companies that we've been trying to get to a hundred million, I, I want to cross a hundred million with that this year. Nice. Cool. Matt, got anything? Yeah. <laughs> I think we, 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 like we covered, covered everything, everything that we wrote down on our whiteboard. We covered a ton of ground. This has just lot. been amazing. You know, I'm curious, Roland. Uh, I, I know you play some music. I think the last time we did a, you were in Vegas. Uh, do you play piano? Is that what it is? I do. Yeah. I played out in clubs, uh, from age 15 to 42, I played wow. uh, keyboards and bass in, uh, in everything from uh, I was the, uh, the token white guy in a 17-piece funk band mm-hmm. to uh, wow. cocktail piano to country music with chicken wire at base, military bases. It's, it was super fun. Oh, my God. Are there any video? Uh, is there video evidence of this somewhere? There's no video. There's I, I have recordings of you know like some of the songs and stuff we did, and somebody just posted a picture of a band I played in when I was 16 on Facebook, which is pretty funny. <laughs> uh, so that was uh, yeah, that's 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 interesting. That's funny. That's awesome. No, we all share that love of music. Joe and I were actually both in bands in high school and college, and there's that's definitely amazing. videos and pictures of us floating around with long hippie hair down to our shoulders and awkward stages. V- very sure. uh, very funny looking pictures. But. <laughs> I had the uh, I had the hair to the mid back as well. It was, <laughs> it was pretty funny. <laughs> I love it. Well, I think uh, anything. Yeah, I mean, I, we've kind of like there's so much to to just kind of marinate on here. That well, I feel like if we try to squeeze any uh, more yeah. concepts into this episode, that uh, people's brains will literally explode. So, for the sake of everyone else <laughs> listening and their their health, <laughs> I think maybe this is a good time to <laughs> maybe say until round three. <laughs> Cool. Uh, Sounds good, man. Yeah, Roland. And so, what? Uh, where should folks check out uh, your podcast and anything else you have on the on the deck? Oh, thank you. The uh, so podcast is Business Lunch uh, on iTunes or Spotify or your platform of choice. The um, I think Pandora coming up too. Mm-hmm. The um, uh, website for me is Roland Fraser R O L A N D F R A S I E R dot com. And then I'm on all the Facebooks and Instagrams and all that under forward slash Roland Fraser. And uh, obviously, traffickingconversionsummits.com or digitalmarketer.com is uh, are two of the primary companies I'm focused on right now, too. Awesome. Cool. And I know you have that shiny, shiny new uh, RolandFraser.com website. It's looking nice. Yeah, they did such a good job on that. Yeah, I was so did. pleased with, with their work. They crushed it. <laughs> awesome. And cool. uh, any any new book or anything? I know we asked you this last time, but anything that you referenced that you know in the last six months or so that really caught your eye? Uh, uh, that is one of my big goals for this year, by the way, I, uh, I hired, uh, Tucker Max's scribe mm-hmm. company to help me write my book. So that's, uh, I'm pretty excited oh. about that. I'm in the middle of that right now. So that should be done probably by the third quarter, I guess. Cool. And, um, but books that I've read, um, I just recently read the autobiographies of John D Rockefeller and, Conrad Hilton and Henry Ford. Is one of them called Titan? Is Rockefeller's book Titan? No, um, that is a great book about Rockefeller. Oh, okay. That's not his autobiography. Got it. Yeah, I want to get it in their actual own words. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting reading. I read, did them all in about a week, and all three of them had, like, those are pretty amazing guys. One guy really built the biggest at the time hotel chain. One, is I think still, if you uh, normalize the dollars, uh, the most wealthy person ever in the history of the planet. Mm. And, um, and one of them invented something that touches our lives every single day. And he wasn't the first, but he was arguably the most successful, the first. And, and there's so many commonalities between those three things. So I really highly, I got a tremendous amount and I would highly recommend that you read all three of those books and take notes about the things that they had in common. And it's, it's very insightful. I think there's, there's a lot of really cool takeaways that are common to all three of those people. So I, I thought that was, that was really good. 
Um, mm. I'm in the middle of reading Branson's uh, book. I think it's The Virgin Way. He's got like four or five of them. Yeah, he does. But I'm going to read them all before I interview him because I really like <laughs> to, to know about people before I talk to him. Yeah, the Losing My but, Virginity uh, is one of my favorite Actually, pr- probably my favorite autobiography I've ever read. I just love that book because it was a great one. It it reads. I mean, it's it it reads like a fiction book. Like his his yeah. life story is just insane. <laughs> it is. It really is. And and he's you know he's exactly on that big challenges. While he became bigger, I think he really shines extra bright because of the uh, the accomplishments outside of business, like. Mm-hmm. the balloon accomplishments and the, you know, the, uh, going across the Atlantic and all of those things, those records that he was able to set and putting his life at risk to do all those things. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, really interesting characters. I just, any autobiography of any successful business person to me, you just take so much from that. And I like the autobiography way better than the much more well-written, well thought out <laughs> non autobiographies because if you're trying to get into their head, into the way that they actually think, I just don't think there's any better way than the auto. Yeah, I love it. And the fact that you have maybe this ongoing list of commonalities between all these folks. So you, yes. That is really powerful too. Yeah, that should be a book someday. I should do that. You should. <laughs> I know, I was just thinking that. <laughs> like, I would love to read those notes. All right, Roland, well, this has been amazing. And uh, yeah, of course, we'll be, we'll be in touch and do this all over again. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll talk soon. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And I hope you just enjoyed this episode you just listened to. Now, right now, before we sign off, I have a few things I would love for you to do. So the very first thing is to go find our guest on Facebook and tell them that you loved their episode with us. That's going to help them uh, just feel good about themselves, but also uh, it's going to spread the word a little bit more for us. So go find them on Facebook. Everybody's on Facebook and go say that you love their episode and maybe one cool thing that you learned there. The second thing is to go to iTunes and subscribe to our podcast. Just look up Hustle and Flow Chart and hit the subscribe button. And the very last thing, the third thing is to leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this podcast and help us spread the word more. That's how more people are going to get uh, this awesome knowledge, this, this cool podcast training and a whole bunch of other cool free training that we give out at evergreenprofits.com. So that's about it. Go find them on Facebook. Go subscribe on iTunes and leave us a review. You would be amazing if you did that, but you're always amazing. So thanks for listening and we'll catch you in the next episode.